Hello, and welcome to Unsolvable. In today's episode, we will be discussing one of the most famous unsolved homicide cases in Finnish history, the Lake Bodum mystery, in which three teenagers' lives were tragically cut short while camping beside the shore of the Finnish lake. If you are ready, let's begin. It was the summer of 1960, four teenagers, Malia Bjorklund, Nils Gustafsson, Anja Marki and Seppo Boisman had planned a couple's retreat to Lake Bodum, located in the south of Finland, just northwest of Helsinki. What was supposed to be a charming getaway for the two couples soon became a horror story. They arrived at the campsite during the daytime on June the 4th and made up camp before taking a dip in the lake. The four of them intended to share a tent and had it pitched on the shore beside the lake. Their afternoon went smoothly and they had enjoyed their first day. As the sun began to set, they climbed into the tent to rest and get some sleep. It was during that first night that the attack happened. By the morning, three out of four of the teenagers were dead, while the other, Niels Gustafsson, was severely injured. The attack had happened sometime between 4am and 6am on June the 5th. Bjorklund, Marky and Boisman were stabbed to death and all had injuries caused by a blunt impact. Gustafsson, who was the only person within the group to survive, sustained a fractured jaw along with several broken facial bones and a concussion. It was at 6am that a separate group of boys, who were birdwatching in the area, noticed a collapsed tent and later reported seeing a man with blonde hair walking away from the camp. It was then later that morning, around 11am, that the bodies were found. Esko Johansson, who was a carpenter by trade, stumbled across the campsite and the four bodies. He alerted the local authorities and the police arrived on the scene around midday. One of the first pieces of information that the police were able to deduce was that the teenagers were attacked while in the tent. However, the assailant had attacked them from outside. The assailant attacked them with a knife and with a blunt instrument. It is strongly believed that the blunt instrument would have been a large rock since there was an abundance of rocks surrounding the campsite and no other weapon was found. Of the four teenagers, Bjorklund, Gustafsson's girlfriend, suffered the most injuries. She was found undressed from the waist down and lying on top of the tent. She had suffered multiple stab wounds, some of which were inflicted after her death, while the other two bodies were found within the tent and the injuries found on their bodies suggested their deaths had been less brutal. Gustafsson was also found lying on top of the tent, beside Bjorklund. He was half dressed and shoeless. During the initial search of the crime scene, investigators discovered that several items belonging to the group were missing. Gustafsson's shoes were among those missing items, however they were later found 500 metres away from the tent along with some of the clothes belonging to the group. Keys to the boys' motorcycles had also been taken, although the motorcycles themselves remained undisturbed. This too added another layer of mystery to the case. Gustafsson, who was found unconscious but alive at the scene, was taken to a nearby hospital to be examined and left to recover. Once Gustafsson's condition improved, the police visited the hospital to speak with him and to take his account of what happened that night. Unfortunately, Gustafsson had little to offer the police, given the fact that he was unconscious for the most part, or at least, that was the story he went with. Whilst there were several suspects linked to the crime, no one was ever charged for the murders. The press criticised the police for the way in which they handled the case and investigated the crime scene. There were many gaps in the police reports, and many pieces of evidence and findings were poorly recorded, if at all. It was also noted that the police had failed to cordon off the surrounding area, which ultimately 
led to the crime scene becoming contaminated. The two main suspects around the time of the murders were Valdemar Gilstrom and Hans Asman. Many local people suspected Valdemar Gilstrom. He worked at a kiosk in the nearby town and was known to have been hostile towards campers. The people in the town described Gilstrom as being violent, stating that he had previously been caught cutting down tents and throwing rocks at campers. Several witnesses also came forward claiming that they saw Gilstrom exiting the crime scene on the morning of the murders, but were too afraid to call the police. Some of the local town folk also said Gilstrom had confessed to them. The police, however, were sceptical of the supposed confessions, since they questioned Gilstrom's mental state. The police were unable to find any hard evidence that linked him to the actual murders, and as such, he was eventually dropped as a suspect. It was then, some nine years later, in 1969, that Gilstrom committed suicide by drowning himself in Lake Bodum. In the years that followed, several authorities requested Gilstrom's data profile in relation to the ongoing investigation, but were left disappointed. Taking a DNA sample was again something that the local police failed to do, and it was now too late since Gilstrom's body has since been cremated. The other suspect, who was the main focus in the public eye, was Hans Asman. Asman only lived a couple kilometres away from Lake Bodum, and remained a person of interest up until 2004. Asman was somewhat of a recluse, and was rumoured to be a former KGB spy. The rumours consequently resulted in him being a suspect in many murder investigations over the years. One thing definitely worth noting is that on the morning of June 6th, 1960, just one day after the murders, Asman arrived at a hospital in Helsinki with what appeared to be blood on his clothes. The hospital staff also described him as being nervous and aggressive. This information was passed on to the police, however, since Asman had a solid alibi on the night of the murders, the police chose to ignore this information and did not investigate it any further. Asman also had blonde hair, which matches the description provided by the group of birdwatchers, who said they had seen a man walking away from the collapsed tent on the morning of the attack. It was later in 2004, almost 44 years after the murders, that Niels Gustafsson was arrested. To public knowledge, Gustafsson had never been a suspect in the case before this point in time. In 2005, the Finnish National Bureau of Investigations declared the case had been solved thanks to new forensic analysis. The prosecution claimed that bloodstain analysis indicated that Gustafsson had gotten into a fight with the other boy while drunk, which resulted in him breaking his jaw. His actions led to him being excluded from the tent which eventually escalated into him committing a triple murder. The trial commenced on August the 4th, 2005. Gustafsson's lawyer argued that Gustafsson would have been incapable of killing three people, given the extent of his injuries, and that the murders were clearly the work of several outsiders. It was common knowledge that Gustafsson's shoes were worn by the killer, and then hidden 500 metres away from the tent. New DNA analysis was a crucial piece of evidence used by the prosecution, as it showed that the blood of all three victims were present on the shoes, however, Gustafsson's blood was not. The prosecution stated that the lack of Gustafsson's blood on the shoes confirmed that his injuries had occurred at a different time to the attack on the murder victims. The prosecution went on to imply that the only explanation was that Gustafsson had committed the murders before faking the theft of the items, including his shoes. They claimed that Gustafsson had inflicted the injuries on himself, before returning to the camp to pretend that he was also attacked. Despite Gustafsson also matching the description of the tall blonde man provided by the birdwatchers, on October 7th, 2005, Gustafsson was acquitted of all charges. The court explained that the verdict was due to the evidence being inconclusive. 
They said that it failed to show that Gustafsson had a motive appropriate to such a horrific crime, and that certainty around the facts were no longer possible given the amount of time that had elapsed. The state of Finland paid Gustafsson a sum of 45,000 euros for the mental suffering caused by the trial. Given that over 60 years has passed since the murders, and that almost all who were involved in the investigation has since passed away, it becomes ever more likely that this mystery will remain forever unsolved. And that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Please remember to like, subscribe and share our videos. And we will be back again next Friday with another unsolvable mystery. Until then, goodbye.